This will be our last message in this series of series on the second coming of Christ. Twenty-four messages in the entire, in the entirety. <clears throat> My objective in these messages has been to separate the coming, the teaching of the coming of Christ from novelty, Amen. and from uh, interesting little bypaths. Mm -hmm. This is a subject that is of such weight you cannot afford to be distracted to opinions of men and various views, valid or not. Uh, you do not want to associate Christ with that kind of thing. <coughs> Whenever we read in Scripture about novelty and distractions and so forth, it's always on man's side, never on God's side. We began this series, I reminded you that there are three appearings of Christ that are mentioned in Scripture. They're all mentioned in the same place, the ninth chapter of Hebrews. And you cannot afford to be wrong on any, any one of these. Yeah. 9, 24, 26, and 28, those verses. The first 24th verse says that Jesus is now appearing <clears throat> in the presence of God for us. 26th verse says, once to the end of the world, he appeared to put away sin with the sacrifice of himself. The 28th verse says that to them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. And no person of sound mind would tell you you could afford to be wrong about Jesus first coming to earth, about him appearing to put away sin with the sacrifice of himself. You can't afford to be wrong about that. I think he came for some other purpose. Mm -hmm. Right. And when you talk about what Jesus is doing now, you can't afford to be wrong. There's no room for opinion mm -hmm. on what Jesus is doing now. He's appearing in the presence of God for us. And yet men have led, religious men, have led the church to not associate the second coming of Christ with being absolutely right and precise with no point for opinion. That's right. No one would dream of allowing different opinions about why Christ entered the world mm -hmm. or why Christ went back to heaven and we just won't allow for it in Christ's coming. Amen. Again, we just can't afford to be wrong about it. <clears throat> mm -hmm. The last message is taken from Revelation 20 and verse 22 and verse 20 where the Lord says, I come quickly and the, John responds, even so, come mm -hmm. Amen. Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, a religion that does not promote anticipation is false. It doesn't make any difference how much Bible they use, what kind of name they got over the door, how much they say they're a Christian, whatever their activities are. If that religion, let me be more precise, if that approach to the Scriptures does not whet in man's heart, an appetite and a longing for glory, it doesn't make any difference what's been said. It's not right. Mm -hmm. Amen. Because we're saved by hope. Mm -hmm. Amen. Romans 8, 24 reminds us. Now, I'm alarmed by the amount of disinterest in this subject. Mm -hmm. But it does exist, and so one of the roles that you can play, or my, along with myself, is to keep this subject out in front of people. So that people know, geez, they are going to confront Jesus. Every, he is coming back and every eye will see him. Mm -hmm. Incidentally, it also is inconceivable that the gospel could be understood and people not be clear about the fact that Christ is coming again. Mm -hmm. Inconceivable. <clears throat> Or it's foolish that one could say, I love him, but I'm not anxious for him to return. Hmm. I just heard a man say, just, just within the last few days, saying, I'm, I want the Lord to come back, I do, but not right now. Hmm. Well, then he doesn't want him to come oh, back. That's right. Because that's precisely when he may come back. <laughs> right now. Now let's look at this text. Even so come, Lord Jesus. <coughs> <clears throat> even, I want to look at this word, even so. He just said, Behold, I come quickly, even so. <clears throat> that is, that's the way I want you to come back. Mm -hmm. Quickly. Jesus said that some other places. Revelation 3.11, he said, I come quickly. <clears throat> 
Revelation 22, 7. <clears throat> I come quickly. <clears throat> Revelation 22, 12. Behold, I come quickly. That is, when he starts to come, there's going to be no chance for any change or any intervention or any adjustment mm -hmm. of character or quick calling on the name of the Lord or quick repenting. <laughs> there couldn't be any time for that. Once he leaves that throne, yeah. there isn't any chance that any kind of moral or spiritual change can be made Amen. for better. There'll be no chance to recover, recoup, mm -hmm. change, adjust, mm -hmm. get ready. Won't be any quickly. What does John say? Oh, he says, that's just the way I want you to come. Amen. Just the way. There's some examples in Scripture of things that were done quickly, so we know what this word means. <clears throat> when the, Jesus appeared to those precious ladies that came to the tomb, they were more anxious to come to Jesus when he was dead than some people are when he's alive. <laughs> Jesus, the angel, told him, go quickly! Go quickly! Tell his disciples that he's risen from the dead. Quickly now, go tell them. Well, what, everybody knows what that means. Just get up and do it right now. Again, in John, the 11th chapter, verse 29, <clears throat> Mary hears that Jesus is coming. Lazarus has di just died. Here's Jesus coming. Said, as soon as she heard that, she rose quickly. She came to him. Acts 22, 19. The angel of the Lord appears to him. Paul says, He said unto me, Make haste, get thee quickly out of Jerusalem. They will not receive the testimony concerning me. That meant right now, get up. That's what John's saying. Just come right, right now. In other words, Jesus is saying, You can't afford ever mm -hmm. to live without this in your mind. Yeah. That Jesus may come and interrupt what I'm doing mm -hmm. right now. And I can tell you, you will never, never ask yourself the question when you're doing, saying, being someplace, do I want to be here? I want to be found doing this when Jesus comes. You will never have any doubt about what the answer is. It'll be crystal clear in your mind. I say, well, I'm not sure. You will never wonder about what the answer to that question is. And the reason for that is this, this awareness of Christ's appearing has a great moral impact on the human spirit. Amen. That once it sees it, convinced of it, and then it's deliberately been left uncertain. <coughs> God has deliberately left it this way. Mm -hmm. So men wouldn't try and draw a timeline and figure it all out. Yep. There's a timeline. Make no mistake about it. But God's the one who has it. Yeah. Amen. And he hasn't bothered to give the ruler to men. Yeah. <laughs> John says, even so, so he's saying just quickly, and even so means I'm willing to settle for the one who testified to this. The text in Revelation 22, 20 says, he that testifies, or they, the one that took, gave you this book of Revelation, <laughs> he says, I'm, that's the one that says I'm coming quick. That's just the way I like it. I like the one who's given the testimony to be the one that says I come quickly. So Jesus just isn't teaching us things, huh? This isn't opening up the future to us. That's the same one that says, I come quickly. See, that's mm -hmm. the same one that says that. Mm -hmm. That's the one that judged the churches. He's the one. He's the one that's coming quickly. The one that judged the churches in the first two chapters. He, the one that all things are open and naked before him with whom we have to do. That's the one. That's the one that's coming quickly. The one who knocks at the door. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. That was of his church, not at the door of sinners. That was at the church. Uh-huh. Jesus is depicted in a layout as he is trying to get in his own church. How's that? Mm -hmm. That's the one that's coming quickly. Please below that will open the door rapidly. Jesus, the one who testified, he's the one that said, I behold, I come quickly. My reward's with me, says so that. Mm -hmm. That's the one. Come like that. I want that one to come. He, we don't get our reward until he gets his. Amen. Amen. So he's going to present the church to himself. A glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Amen. And until that happens, you don't get your reward. Mm -hmm. He's got to get what he came for. You know, God told him, I'm going to give you the heathen for your inheritance. Mm -hmm. 
So I'll give you the I'll give you the sons of Israel, but I'll throw the heathen in on the side. A little bonus. So we are we Gentiles, we're also rams. The power of the gospel is the power of God to salvation of the Jew and also. Mm -hmm. That's what we got in, also to the Greek. Amen. <coughs> now let's look at the logic of this cry. Behold, I come quickly, and the, and the cry I'm referring to is John said, Even so. Come, Lord Jesus. This is a very logical cry using kingdom logic. For instance, the blessed hope of the church is identified as the coming of Christ. Mm -hmm. Titus 2.13 <coughs> Looking, this is the grace of God teaches us to do this. Looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and Savior Jesus Christ. Nowhere in Scripture does it ever suggest that a glorious coming is connected with a secret rapture. Mm -hmm. That's right. <laughs> There's nothing glorious about something secret. Yeah. But this prayer, this is a glorious appearing. Mm -hmm. Amen. And it's when we're looking for, well, and it makes sense, doesn't it? Say, even so. Mm -hmm. Amen. For someone who's looking for this. <clears throat> And the scripture says to them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin mm -hmm. unto salvation. That's a full cup of salvation. We, mm -hmm. We're sipping from the cup now. And it seems like a lot. And it is a lot until you compare it with what's to come. <laughs> then it's first fruits. Mm -hmm. Then it's the beginning. Looking for, if we're looking for, well, it makes good sense to say, even so come Lord Jesus. So when someone says, I don't feel comfortable with them coming now, they're not looking. That's why. The salvation is designed to get them to look, so then we break open the break open the precious elixir of the gospel and start delivering, because whoever thinks that way has not really heard and believed the gospel. Because the gospel designed to produce this looking. And the scripture tells us we're waiting. We're waiting for him. 1 Thessalonians 1.10, after he said they had turned from idols to serve the living God and to wait for his Son from heaven, to wait for him. Well, if we're waiting for him, it makes sense, doesn't it? Say, even so, come. Those are the kind of people say that. Mm -hmm. 2 Thessalonians 3.4 says, <coughs> We have confidence in the Lord touching you, that you both do and will do the things we command you. And the only way that can be done, you see, is for you to be looking for Christ. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, religion is burdensome if you don't have something up there ahead yeah. that you're mm -hmm. anticipating. Mm -hmm. And the Lord's table. Mm -hmm. He says, as often as you do this, you show forth the Lord's death till He come. Mm -hmm. He said, this sort of whets your appetite. Mm -hmm. This is, we're, we're partaking, remembering the beginning mm -hmm. and the current ongoing of our salvation. But there's more to come. <laughs> more to come we're looking for so it makes perfect sense the logic of this cry even so come Lord Jesus <clears throat> it's unreasonable <clears throat> illogical for a person not to want Jesus to come some Amen. particularly when they're not when they're not in when they profess to be in Christ it's Amen. unreasonable for them and this is a glorious <clears throat> expectation <clears throat> even so because there's things connected with his coming that delight the heart and make you leap for joy with this. Amen. For instance, 1 John 3, 1 says, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew not him. Beloved, now we are the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he, shall, when, when he shall appear, then shall we also appear with him in glory. <laughs> oh, that's... We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. First John 3, 2 says. Well, that whets your appetite for it. Mm -hmm. You are incognito until then. We can, uh, when you walk with the Lord yourself, you can kind of recognize, you know, the other children, but nobody else really can. Nobody else really can. We're undercover. We're like David was before he was king. Samuel anointed him king. That's right. Well, on the surface, Saul was still sitting under that. <laughs> Sitting on a throne, but but it says the spirit left Saul and came on David yeah. before he got to the throne. Yeah. Well, it did with you too. Huh? It did with you too. You received the spirit 
And you've been tagged the king and the priest before you really occupy your inheritance. How's that? So we're anxious for him coming because that's when we're going to occupy it <clears throat> with a glorious thing. <clears throat> we have a house presently in heaven. It's our resurrection body. It's the house he's talking about. And he spells it out. 2 Corinthians 5, first five verses. <clears throat> Verse 1 and 2 says, We know, brethren, we know if our earthly house of this tabernacle, body, were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. In this body we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. Amen. Well, when Jesus <laughs> returns, he's going to bring that. Then they're going to be raised at that time. People kind of banter about it. One person told me one time, well, I don't, I don't think that resurrection body exists now. That's not going to exist until you're raised, dead or raised. Well, you, God said it's eternal in the heavens. That's what he said. So what, who has trouble with it? Anyone have trouble with this? He says it's eternal in the heavens. That's what he said. We have a building of God not made with hands eternal in the heavens. So it's there already. Your body's already Amen. prepared. The works are finished from the foundation of the world. Amen. Everything connected with your salvation so far as the beginning and sustaining all this, it's already done. Yeah. It's just whether you get into it or not. Resolve to follow the Lord. Think of this. This is connected with this coming. <coughs> the warfare is going to end. Yeah. Hmm. You know, when David, there were times when David was chased from pillar to post. Sometimes he fought and won battle, battles. Sometimes he hid in caves. There were battles going on. Strivings, oppositions, conflict. Not anymore when Jesus comes. <coughs> Galatians 5.5 5 says, We through the Spirit wait. We through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness through faith. What's the hope of righteousness? That's when the righteousness will be 100%. Yeah. You carry about with you now an unrighteous segment to your person, an old man. Mm -hmm. you got flesh and blood. It can't enter. We already know it can't enter. But see, this isn't going to be the case after Jesus comes again. Now the scripture says, the flesh lusts against the spirit. Galatians 5.17. And the spirit against the flesh. And these two are contrary the one to the other. So you can't do the things you would. Your flesh, it can't, it can't do what it really wants to do because the Spirit's yeah. fighting against it. And the, your spirit, it can't do what it wants to do. It's got this luggage of the flesh that it's got to contend with. But that's all over when Jesus comes again. See, that's connected with his return. Glad day when that's over. Remember Paul one time stepped back and said, Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Next verse says, I thank God through Jesus Christ my Savior. He's coming. Deliverance is on the way, brother. Yeah. It's coming. <clears throat> the world, you know, it, it tries to dress up and pamper the body. We're looking forward to getting rid of it. <laughs> Wouldn't that be a good sign of the beauty pageant? It's all flesh is grass. <laughs> huh? Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. That'd be a good slogan. That'd yeah. probably change how they dressed and everything, wouldn't it? Yeah. Well, there's other things associated with this glorious expectation. Then we're ever going to be with the Lord. Yeah. <coughs> the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a voice, with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. Mm -hmm. Dead in Christ shall rise first, as before the living are changed. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds in the air, with me the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. I understand we're with the Lord now by faith seated with him in heavenly places but see that's not the only place we are. <laughs> we also are in a world we're strangers we're Strangers and pilgrims in the earth. Mm -hmm. So the scripture says that we're here too. But ever with the Lord means there isn't going to be any other presence. Mm -hmm. No competing presence. No part of your personality that gravitates downward. Yeah. What a blessed thought. No body to subdue, keep under. 
No more. See, I'm showing why John could say even so quickly. I'm showing why he says this. Because there's things connected with Christ's coming that aren't connected with anything else. <laughs> we'll go no more out. Revelation 3.12 He holds this promise out. This little nugget. He holds this out to you. <laughs> he that overcometh Will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out? Mm -hmm. Boy, that's wonderful. Amen. See, the night after the meeting's over, we'll go out. Yeah. Tomorrow morning, you, you that work in the workplace, you'll go out. Mm -hmm. Now, you'll be able to find pasture, but you will have to hunt for it. Yeah. He'll prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemies. He will do this. But the go no more out means you're not going to you're not going to leave the Lord's presence to go down and see Israel at the foot of the mountain. <laughs> Remember Moses, he had to go out. <laughs> there he was in the presence of the Lord. He went out and there was what he saw down in the mountain there. Uh -huh. yeah. They'll go no more out. Yeah. With a blessing. No more downers. No more rough landings on Monday morning. Think of Revelation 21.1. <laughs> I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and first earth were passed away. See, you can't see the new till the old is gone. You get accustomed to that right now. You're getting accustomed to this kingdom principle now. You can't get anything new from God till you let go of the old. Yeah. Won't happen. See, people that are bored with religion, the reason they're bored is they're hanging on to what's old. Yeah. That's why. No more sea. So there'll be no more sea. No more sea. I think of John. <coughs> we understand him to have been up in his way high in his 90s at the time he wrote this. He'd been exiled out to the Isle of Patmos, which was a little finger of land jutting out into the Aegean Sea. He might have been hearing the waves crash up on the shore, you know. When he was there on the isle in the spirit of the Lord's day, something about looking over a ocean that is turbulent, that is disconcerting. It's a thing you can't control. When ships are tossed in the sea, there's nothing they can do about it. You have to try and acclimate to it somehow. You have to adjust to the waves. A ship that's out in these 75 foot waves. Man that used to work with me was in the Navy for 38 straight months. He was at sea during the Second World War. He told me about these tall waves. You look like you're up in a seven, eight story building looking down. Then you're looking up like this. And I said, Well, Gil, I said, How did oh, how did you do how did they do it? Oh, he said the ship people had to learn how to sail on this kind of situation. You had to learn how to ride those waves. Otherwise, it dashed the vessel in two. Well, see, in Christ, you do have to learn to ride the waves. You have to learn to do this. This is what this good brother that we heard uh, these emails from, he's riding the waves, see. He gets up here and sometimes you look down, it's a long way down, but it's a long way up. But you adjust, you get grace to adjust your vessel so the waves don't break you apart. Amen. Well, there's going to be none of that on the other side. Amen. We're not going to have to adjust to trouble or learn how to acclimate ourselves among heathens. So David one time had to pretend like he's crazy. You know, he fell down on the ground and says he scrabbled. <laughs> Didn't mean he was playing the game. He's foaming at the mouth. Huh? Had to pretend like he's crazy so the Philistines wouldn't kill him. Nobody wouldn't have that enough presence of mind. You want to say, well, how can I do that? Just to go to talking about the Lord and anxious you're looking forward to death, and they'll think you're crazy and leave you alone. <laughs> it's the truth. Give it a try. This will kind of back off from me and give you a little rest. No more sea. Revelation 21 4 says there'll be no more death. See, a lot of things we confront because of death. They have to confront because of death. Death isn't always like an instant procedure. Sometimes you have to watch somebody die that you love. Mm. Adam and Eve had to watch each other die for over 900 years. Yeah. All the while remembering what brought this on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
If there's anything, anything is, is deteriorates, or illness, or morose feelings, or downheartedness, or discouragement, they're all facets of death. They all are. They're, they're, they're things that pull people down. So no more death means there's nothing. Not only did people just not expire, nothing connected with death is going to be there. There isn't going to be any decline of any kind. Nothing will ever wear off. Nothing will ever get old. Amen. Nothing will ever get dull. Nothing will ever hurt. See, all those are facets of mm -hmm. pain. Mm -hmm. hmm. I candidly look forward to the time when I won't hurt anymore. Yeah. Amen. Amen. When things won't hurt you as well as yeah. infirmity. Amen. No more death. See, that makes sense for a person like that to say, yeah. even so come. No more curse. Revelation 22, 3. <laughs> there shall be no more curse. Mm -hmm. But what, what's the antidote to that? But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. That's yeah. why there's not going to be any more curse. Because yeah. he's going to be right, we're going to be right there. Yeah. Not by faith, right there. God himself will be with us. Mm -hmm. Amen. And no curse ever comes near God. Yeah, that's right. None at all. So if you get through to God, you'll be out of the domain of the curse. And Jesus said the angels are going to gather out all things that offend. I don't advocate making a log of this, but if you were to make a log on things that offended you in a day, you'd fill up more pages than you dare to imagine. Things that just offended you. Some of them will be things in you. Yeah, huh? that's right. So when it says that there will be no more curse at all, <coughs> there will be nothing about you that will displease you. What a thought, huh? That's where we're headed, brethren. Going to gather out everything that offends. He's going to do it. You won't have to do it. He'll do it. Here, you've got to, <laughs> you got to purge it. Mortify your members that are up on the earth. Mm -hmm. you got to do this. But he's going to do this one. Yeah. All things that are fit. Mm -hmm. And then God's not going to be hidden anymore. Isaiah 45, 15. <coughs> the prophet said, Thou art a God that hidest thyself, O Lord God of Israel. Mm -hmm. You hide yourself. Sometimes when it seems like God's distant, in your heart, you know he really isn't. He's a very present help in the time of trouble. And he's not far from every one of us. But it seems like sometimes it seems like, well, that's what God does. Sometimes he, he pulls back a little bit and lets you stew in your juice. Mm -hmm. Not to hurt you. Mm -hmm. Because he really wants us to call out to him. He really does. Yeah. Yeah. He, he loves to hear the call of his children. And he's a God that hides himself. But he's not going to do that there mm -hmm. at all. That just has to do in the flesh and blood arena. Mm -hmm. well, in the flesh and blood arena, God hides himself. Mm -hmm. Sometimes he's got to convince you how strong your faith really is. Uh, we can sit about and theorize about our faith, but God knows how to point out how strong or perhaps weak. He can point it out to you. That's why he does this. But that's all done in the world to come. See, things associated. This is the glorious expectation. When Jesus comes again, <coughs> then the thing we're being nurtured for is going to take place, and the saints will take the kingdom. Yeah. Then we'll be able to handle it. If God were just to come down now and say, I'm going to give all power right now to you, well, it's a frightful thought just to just think about it. We, 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 we can't handle it. See, flesh and blood can't handle all power. So when people stand in the name of the Lord and boast that they've got all this kind of authority, they're overstating the case. They're overstating the case. Christ has all authority, but he hasn't given it all to us yet. We're not... Uh, you remember James and John? That's after they've been walking with Jesus for a while. And they saw some people coming to them, some Greeks, and they said, uh, Would you like us to call fire down on them? I often wonder what they'd have done if he just said, go right ahead. Call it down. See, Jesus had sent them out before and said, don't go into the way of the Gentiles. Do not go into the way of the Gentiles. So they weren't saying this because they were like stupid. They couldn't connect 
these uh -huh. Gentiles with the cause of Christ because everything Jesus had told them to that point led them to believe that, uh, not everything, but led them to believe that the Jews it was confined to them. So until mm -hmm. we called on fire, he said, oh, you don't know what spirit you're of. That's right. Mm -hmm. See, but then you will, in the glory. <laughs> He'll be able to trust your judgment, so to speak. If I may speak vulgarly, the Lord will be able to trust your judgment. He'll say, do whatever you want. Just, just go do it. Because you'll have his mind. You'll have an immortal body. There'll yeah. be nothing about uh -huh. you. But, whew, what a thought. Amen. The saints will take the kingdom. Daniel said that three times. We've mentioned these verses quite often. I'll just mention Daniel 7, 27. The kingdom and dominion and greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. In case you wonder what kind of kingdom this is, it says whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Yeah. And it's going to be given to all the saints. Not to you, to all the saints. But you're part of that, see. They're going to have authority. <coughs> They'll have authority when Jesus comes again. No more... Uh... Well, here's what he said. Luke 19, 17. He said unto them, Well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in a few things, have thou authority over ten cities. How's that? He, he was given five pounds. Mm -hmm. Pound is a de denomination of money. They say this way, he's given five dollars, mm -hmm. and the Lord said, I'm going to give you authority over ten cities. Well, there's no... There's no Comparison between the two. Authority over ten cities. Who mm -hmm. dares to imagine what's involved in the world to come? Mm -hmm. So if you don't have much authority now, just wait. Just wait. Yeah. Just wait. It's, it bothers some people to be under someone else's authority, but oh, just wait. You have authority then. Then Jesus said, Revelation 2.27, of those that overcome now, he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken in shivers as I received of my Father. That's the one he said he'd give power over the nations. Just think of that. That's connected with his return now. It's not connected with here now. Right. And you're not going to be the tail anymore. <laughs> you're going to be the head. Well, what a thought. That's all involved in this authority, see. Deuteronomy 28, 13, he just sort of hinted at this to the Israelites. The Lord shall make thee the head and not the tail. Thou shalt be above only. Is that good? Then you'll, be, you'll be on the top all the time. To be above only and thou shalt not be beneath. Now he tied under the law, he said, If thou wilt hearken unto the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day to observe and do them. If you do that, well, they didn't do that. And they couldn't do that, and neither can you do that. Mm -hmm. See, it had to be on their own. He didn't say, if you ask, ask me to help you to keep them, I'll give you grace to keep them. That, that wasn't the agreement under the law. You had to do it by yourself. Mm -hmm. You had to do it. But he still leaked out there what he desires. Yeah. He can make you the head and not the tail. Occasionally here in this world... <coughs> You can taste of this in some kind of triumph or victory. You can taste of this. But this is going to be a permanent, unchanging condition uh -huh. in the world to come. We will reign with Christ. There will be no question about it. And we'll judge the world and judge angels. This is connected now with Christ's coming. 1 Corinthians 6, 2 and 3. Don't you know you're going to judge the world? These little bitty decisions we got to make on earth don't fall apart. Mm -hmm. When you've got a challenge or something you got that involves you making a decision, I don't say as some say this as someone who has attained perfection because I have not. Mm -hmm. But when you face something, just how, what am I going to do? I, just think about this, because that's what he told him to do. Yeah. You're going to judge the world, don't you think? God can help you to judge this little thing. Yes. Don't balk at this. You're slated for big things. You're being trained now to do this. So seek the Lord's help in that. And we'll judge angels as well. Talk about a big thing. Blessed are the meek. They shall inherit the earth. Well, I can't even think that big in this world. Can you? Can't even think that. We think maybe of my house. That'd be a pretty good start right there, wouldn't it? Or my, my relatives. 
See, you got big problems there. Maybe you've got your house in control. That's conceivable. How about your relatives? How about all them? Huh? How about that? You say, well, I got that. How about the neighborhood then? That's it. And pretty soon you'll find out how narrow the circle is here. But not there. The earth. <laughs> You're going to just inherit the earth. And that's going to be one that's been renovated. Yeah. Ah, that's going to be a new earth. We're in dwells righteousness. You wouldn't want to inherit the other one anyway. <laughs> and you will be heir of all things. Revelation 21, 7. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. How's that? <coughs> and the world to come will be in our charge. Ephesians, uh, Hebrews 2, verses 5 through 9 teach us that. See, I'm showing here the glorious expectations connected with certain things. It isn't just that you need to be looking for Christ's return. Just um, make yourself do it now. When you go to bed tonight, say, I need to think about Christ's return. Well, how you, this is how you do it. You connect it with the promises he's made. That's going to happen at that time. And that makes it a lot easier to think about it and dwell upon it. Then we'll reign with Jesus. 2 Timothy 2.12 says, If we suffer with him, we'll reign. Reign. <coughs> we'll reign with him. Amen. I understand it's one thing to talk about reigning. It's another thing to reign. Mm -hmm. That's another matter. To reign. But it isn't going to be another matter there. That will be the matter. Amen. It will be the matter then. And here, listen to this promise. This is connected now. When Jesus comes, this is when this is all going to happen. Revelation 3.21 <coughs> says to the overcomer, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne. Mm -hmm. Say, what, what kind of arrangement is that, Jesus? He says, as I also overcame and am set with my Father in his throne. So it's going to be like that. That's quite something to contemplate, isn't it? Mm -hmm. He's not sitting like a child on the lap. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about joint air. That's what he's talking about. Yeah. Reigning with, that's what he's talking about. Just because that's what Jesus does. Jesus is sitting on God's lap. You listen in the Bible stories. That's not what he's doing. He's reigning with him there. Because yeah, yeah. that's what's going to happen to the overcomer. Do you think to yourself, perhaps maybe you're even in a trial now, that if I can get through this trial, I'll sit with Jesus on his throne. You've got to learn to kind of think this way. And then to connect that with the coming of the Lord. As the scripture says, we're heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Well, we are said of the Lord Jesus that he is sitting at the right hand of God, <coughs> exalted in the heavens. And Hebrews 10, 13 says the kind of posture he has there. From henceforth expecting, anticipating. That's Jesus. Now, if he's expecting, you certainly should be able to expect. Because you're in him. You could share in Christ's expectation of what everything is openly and unquestionably under his feet in the perception of all creation. Everything's under his feet now. But see, it doesn't, doesn't look that way to a carnal mind. But it, it, it will look that way there. And it will to you also. Well, I've labored as, uh, I was about to say as best I know how, but I'm not sure that that would be accurate. I wanted to be, to show you the apostolic doctrine on the coming of Christ versus a systematic approach mm -hmm. to it, carnally systematic, <coughs> trying to tie it in with all kind of scriptures and and ending up kind of losing a sense of the sanctifying power mm -hmm. of Christ's return. What okay. that does, you can look forward to it, even if you don't understand all the attending circumstances, you do know the ones that concern you, because he spilled them out. Mm -hmm. What's going to happen? So if you're saved by hope, <coughs> that hope can't, it can't be cloudy. Mm -hmm. If that's what you're saved by, it can't be vague. Right. You can't be unsure about this or, or it, because it impacts on working out your salvation with fear and trembling. God's given you a solemn charge. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You, there's, there's a part of this you've got to do or it isn't going to be done. Right. But you can't do this without hope. 
And, and so the, the left hope out of the ethereal, he's tied hope to Jesus coming again, see? Mm -hmm. And uh, in that blessed hope, you can prepare for Christ's return. Mm -hmm.